Hi, I'm Tony Armour, Film Commissioner for St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Florida, and this is actually our third podcast. So if you're watching this, you know that we are, uh, we're doing these regular Film Commission podcasts where we're highlighting businesses and locations in the St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Pinellas County, Florida area. And today we are at Echo Bridge Pictures. And Echo Bridge Pictures is an animation studio that has actually moved to St. Pete from Los Angeles. And with us today is uh, Esteban Valdez. And Esteban, ex what exactly is your title with Echo Bridge? Are you founder, owner, president, CEO, all of the above? All of the above, coffee maker, uh, janitor, and uh, occasional in-betweener. But it, yeah, I founded the studio about five years ago. And we were originally up from Massachusetts. And then we came down. Uh, well, it was just myself originally, and then you know, we started in Tampa. Really wasn't happening there, and then we came over to the St. Pete side, where it's just big art boom, and we were at the beginning of that too. Great. So this is home for us. Good, good. Well, we uh, we we love the fact that you're in Pinellas County and and are and doing good work over here. Tell us a little bit about the type of work that you guys do and the type of companies that you're doing work for. So we work primarily in 2D animation hand-drawn and we do a lot of music videos commercials web shorts uh, recently we've started getting into television and feature films and that's sort of our our mainstay has been television episodic work and we've worked for people uh, or companies rather such as Fox FX Cartoon Network Nickelodeon uh, PBS we've worked for ad agencies such as Edelman and McKinney and we've also done work with a uh, music groups such as Sony Music, Epic Records, and Universal Music Group. Well, good. So it sounds like you guys have been really rocking and rolling since, uh, since, you've, uh, since you've started. So now what we're going to do actually is you can see the animators actually in the background busily uh, working away, creating all of this wonderful stuff that, uh, that Esteban is uh, hovering over like a, like a proud, proud papa. So we're going we're gonna to cut away here and show you a little bit, a little bit of work and a little bit of uh, Echoes Real. Some, some really good some really good stuff that you guys are working on and uh, and it's just one of those sort of secret hidden gems right here in St. Pete that no one knows is right here doing you know this national national work for major networks and, uh, and advertising brands um, so one of the things we like to do on the podcast is not just you know sort of rattle on about all the wonderful things we have in the St. Pete Clearwater area which of course we do have lots of wonderful things here uh, but we like to talk about sort of news in the business and kind of what's happening in the world of film and entertainment and digital media as well. So in this particular episode, obviously, we're going to kind of focus everything on animation since we are here at the, uh, the lovely Echo Bridge Pictures in St. Pete. So just this week, uh, the Oscar nominations came out for 2015. And animated films are obviously one of the categories of the Oscars. And so for this particular year, Big Hero 6, the Box Trolls, how to Train Your Dragon 2, Song of the Sea, and the Tale of Princess, how do you pronounce that? Cayuga. Cayuga uh, are the Oscar-nominated animated films. So 
I know we were t- chatting a little bit before we started the podcast here. I have not seen all of these films. I've seen you know Big Hero Six, How to Train Your Dragon, and um, the Lego Movie, which is actually not nominated. But uh, give me a little bit of uh, your thoughts on the, the nominees for Best Animated Film so far this year. Honestly, or candidly speaking, I kind of thought they were okay. Yeah. Um, Box Trolls, I had didn't get a chance to see. It was on my queue to watch. Uh, Princess Cayuga got to see little clips of it. Song of the Sea was absolutely beautiful. Um, How to Train Your Dragon 2 was cute, but I didn't feel like it actually went anywhere. And uh, the Lego movie was fun, but I I could agree why it wasn't nominated. Sure. Well, and it's it's interesting. You know, the animated feature is sort of a new, new category. In the Oscars, it has only been there for maybe ten years or, or something like that. Yeah, that, uh, that part actually kind of bothers me. It's not to say that animation shouldn't be in there, but to separate it off in its own little category, because that's uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it it further separates the medium because that's what it really is. It's it's kind of a medium in itself. Sure, you know, it's not a genre, so to speak. So, but that's my take. Yeah, I mean, you would, so you would prefer that the, you know, if there's a film that's an animated feature and it's going to be nominated for, for a, a best picture, it should be right along with, you know, the live action best yes, pictures. Yes, absolutely. Well, and especially if you consider that a lot, of, a lot of live action films nowadays are primarily animated. You take a, take a look at something like Guardians of the Galaxy, which is not nominated for best picture, but I think something like 90% of that film contains, you know, CGI. Yeah, essentially. So it's it's an animated film, whether you call it a you know photorealistic animation or whatever you want to call it. That's an animated film, just right along with, you know, Big Hero Six or whatever is an right. animated film. I mean the same thing with Avatar several years ago. Right. I mean that movie's <laughs> practically it's one hundred percent animated. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, I think it won Best Picture. No, I, I don't know. It didn't win Best Picture, but it was nominated That's for right, Best nominated. Picture. So, I mean, things like that. It, I've, obviously, if it's running up there with you know, the rest of live action, you know, why shouldn't the rest of it? Sure. One of, one of our researchers in the background might be able to kind of look up and tell us what film did win Best Picture of the Year that Avatar, Avatar won. One of our many behind-the-scenes producers here. Just shout, just shout that out to us when you, uh, when you know. That was Slumdog Was it Slumdog? Well, that's what iPhones are for. Google it. Somebody. <laughs> Maylin can, May can Google that and look that, look that, look that up for us. Um, but I, I won't go off on Avatar in this particular episode, which I, I refer to as Average Tar, because I thought it was a very, uh, a very average film. Oh, it was Fern Gully on steroids. Yeah. I mean, it was spectacular visually and 3D-wise, because people had not seen that before. You know, it's cutting edge as far as that goes. But as far as the story goes, it was predictable and average. So that's my, that's my Average Tar rant for the, uh, for the moment. It won an Oscar and Best Achievement in Cinematography. It won Cinematography. What uh, what year was that? 2010. 2010. What won Best Picture in 2010? Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker. Now, Hurt Locker. There you go. I liked Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker, not animated. Not an animated film, but, uh, but a good film. So, um, so, interestingly, then, talking about the Oscar nominations for Best Animated Film, a lot of people feel like the Lego movie was snubbed and should have been nominated for Best Oscar because it was obviously wildly successful financially and, you know, very popular, and it's a film that was a, a lot of fun, and a lot of people enjoyed it. Um, but there are some, some reasons why people think that it did not get nominated. One of those is that the animation professionals, and this is, comes from a variety, a variety article that was written about the, the reasons why the film did not get nominated, so I'm properly accrediting uh, where we're getting our, our information from. So the um, uh, animation professionals pick the nominations. So it's not... You know, fans that are picking it, but the animation professionals like yourself, who are in the academy, that are that are picking the nominations. Actually, we did an interview with uh, Jerry Beck, and he is an animation historian. Mm-hmm. He also covered the Oscars, and we spoke to him about that too. And the animation uh, review goes to everybody. And I know a couple of was last year, nobody watched any of the submissions, and so this year, I, I mean, maybe that might have changed. And, people started watching them, or a select few, but I think as far as the Lego movie's concerned, I mean, it's oh, it's an okay film, right? you know? I mean, yeah, there's a huge, big name company pushing behind it and rooting for it and getting the marketing out, you know, on all successful levels. But I don't necessarily think that makes for a 
quality film. Right. Should should it be Oscar nominated? Oscar Oscar is supposed to be, you know, the best of the best. You know, the best film in that particular category, regardless of its, you know, financially successful. Um, I guess uh, 2001 is when the Academy first started doing a best animated feature. And, you know, at that time, you know, maybe you'd only have, you know, eight or so animated features per year. Now you have over, you know, 20 films a year. That, that's great. That, which, well, is, which is great. The more animated films are getting done. So that's sort of another reason, you know, they say tougher competition is a reason that it may not have gotten nominated. Um, something that's not on this list is essentially the fact that, like you said, it, it's a toy company. You know, it's based off a toy. It's marketing. It's advertising for the Lego toys. So I could see where maybe a lot of people would hold that against the yeah, film. Yeah, it, it feels disingenuous. For the most part, and then I, I mean, when I I saw the movie, it was it was fun and it was entertaining, but I don't know. Maybe people have just sort of lost their it, it's lackluster. Sure, you know, it's yeah. not what people are looking for anymore. I mean, when you look at the nominations that were this year, it's sort of telltale that that sort of comedic humor and you know the little twist at the end. Of, yeah, you know, oh, it's something heartfelt and warm, and you didn't get that earlier on. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't feeling it too much. Sure, sure. No, I can get it. Well, and another another possible reason is uh, that the animation branch loves handmade movies. Well, you you guys um, do a lot of hand drawn two D animation here. Tell me why you would think that that's you know part of a contributing factor to that. Well, I think people enjoy handmade stuff all together. I mean, craft beer. You know, uh, going out to eat. At I mean, when somebody's actually making something that you know they care about, for the most part, uh, it shows. I think there's something with hand-drawn animation that kind of transcends over the pixels. So even if you're you know doing things digitally, like we were doing on with the styluses here, I mean, it's still people drawing and making a line. It's almost the equivalent of you know a handwritten letter. You know, versus an email or a sure. text. You know, there's a personal connection between artist and audience, and I think people resonate with that. Uh, I know in the in the business itself, you know, everybody's dying for 3D because that's sort of the go-to. It, it supposedly simpler, right? But <laughs> traditional animation, even though it's labor-intensive, much like 3D, all of it, uh, animation, nothing but work. Uh, people just uh, you can feel the artistry come through in the line. And, and I think that's something that people, you know, people know it takes a long time to animate things, and they know it takes a long time to make movies. But give us a little bit of a sense for how long it actually takes to animate something. You know, we all know 24 frames per second. So, you know, it used to be in the past, you, you would have to draw, you know, 24 individual frames per second. Pic oh, yeah. Pictures or frames in order to get one second of film. You know, you're actually hand drawing that. T talk a little bit about... How you know, is that when you talk about hand drawn animation? That's still what has to be done. Well, for us, I mean, there's you know a lot of companies that use different software like Flash or Toon Boom, and uh, they do motion graphics with mm -hmm. their character art, which is which is really good. But for us, you know, we're still doing a lot of hand drawn work. Uh, and just to give you a time frame, and this depends on the type of project and the quality that you know clients asking for. Uh, Sometimes it can last us about a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one case, we're doing a commercial, and we've been on it for about nine months. And it's mm -hmm. only 60 seconds. Nine months for a 60-second commercial. Right. And so, I mean, if we were to animate this podcast, depending <laughs> upon how quickly you'd want it to go, I mean, we could get it done in about you know, a couple of months. Or if you wanted it like classically done, each line, you know, one by one, you know, each frame, uh, probably take us, you know, Half well, a year. We, I guess we would try not to do a podcast with any sort of topical news information at that point if it's going to take months to, uh, <laughs> yeah, months to get done. Have you, by any chance, have you seen the, um, the Ricky Gervais show? It was on HBO. Yes. Where they animated their audio podcast. Yep. Those are great. Yeah, those were, those were really well done. If anybody gets a chance to check out the Ricky Gervais show, uh, HBO, I think it's on demand on HBO or whatever, you can find uh, their audio podcast that he does. And they, what they did is they animated just the the podcast with giving it it's it's really funny i would literally laugh my butt off the entire time watching uh watching those things so um we're gonna are gonna transition here into uh into a few other a few other items so some other cool things that are kind of happening in animation right now is that there's actually a new trailer out for the peanuts movie a yes. new peanuts animated movie tell me a little bit about uh what you know about that and and what's going on with that film 
the green light mm -hmm. and they'd been doing a lot of tests to get the animation to look like the, the way the Schultz family wants it to. Right. And on the, sorry, I touch that again. But um, for me personally, I, I'm not too thrilled with 3D, but this is one of those films where it's, it has a nice blend of uh, 2D elements and 3D you know, production work mm -hmm. and values. And I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I can't wait to see what it comes out to be. Yeah, and, and for those people who I would, I would hope that you're familiar if you're watching this with the Peanuts, you know, Charles Schultz developed the Peanuts right. comic strip, strip that ran in newspapers for, well, still running today. And um, he died know, 10 years ago, maybe, something like that. No idea. And it started this comic strip in the 1950s, I believe, and probably one of the most well-known comic strips in the, in the entire world, essentially. Um, and, of course, with, you know, Peanuts... Christmas, everybody, you know, Charlie Brown with the little oh, Christmas yeah. tree, and everybody loves the the original Peanuts animated TV shows that were out in, I guess, the you know the late seventies, nineteen eighties, and they're still rerunning and playing those today. And so now we have this you know Peanuts feature film, which in the trailer, which we'll show a little clip of here, you know, um, you know, pretty much focuses on Snoopy and the Red Baron, which is a, a cool kind of way to you know open this up. And so I'm I'm excited to see it too. It's kind of one of those things from from your childhood that's coming back to be like oh, yeah. a new Peanuts thing. Hopefully you don't screw it up, kind of. See, that's the. I, there's a love hate with with properties, right? Yeah, I love it when they're actually making something that, like the peanut stuff, is fantastic, and they really seem to be keeping true to the original elements of the story and the characters. But I also have this feeling that you know when big companies like DreamWorks or Sony Pictures are doing licensed properties, mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a red flag that says you know we've kind of run out of ideas, we don't know what to do anymore. So let's just start going with the safer bets of, of you know, picking out properties that have already been established and have a market. You know, and, and that's where I've, I feel like uh, in the Oscar nominations earlier that people weren't going with you know, Lego Movie because right. it's, it, they've seen it all before. It, sure. It's not original, so to speak. Um, so like Song of the Sea, I mean, I've never seen anything like that before or, any, or heard anything like it. You know, it's just fantastic. And well, t tell us a little bit about that. Maybe we can, hopefully we'll find a clip online here we can drop in so we can see maybe the trailer for Song of the Sea as well. Yeah, Song of the Sea, uh, without giving it away too much, uh, it's based off of, you know, old uh, European folklore. Mm -hmm. And stylistically, it's absolutely fantastic. It's traditional 2D animation, and uh, I think it was coming out of Ireland. Cartoon Saloon was the studio doing it. And... You know, it's very unique, and it, I mean, the emotional roller coaster that you would go on is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And because it's original, the same thing with uh, Princess Cayuga, which is a very just new, which fantastic Which Japanese whole source. film? Yeah, from Studio Ghibli, which yeah. is, you know, a, what don't they put out that's marvelous, right? But, uh, you know, we look at the roster of films, you know, from this year, last year, all the summer blockbusters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just been, you know, licensed property after licensed property after licensed property. and yeah, everybody seems to keep going to that or, you know, finding a book that... If people have already read it, if people have already seen it, what are we really contributing and that's to? And that's sort of the interesting conundrum in the film business and the film world in general right now is that, you know, when you talk about the big studios, you know, their number one job is to make money. So, you know, essentially what they're doing is they're not making a film because they want to make a you know, great piece of art, they're making something that they market. The question, the question that they're always going to ask isn't, you know, how good can this movie be, but how can we sell this movie? How can we market this movie? Which is why you go back to you know, buying a book that's a, you know, a, a bestseller or you know, an old property that they're going to rehash and try and do something with again. And you know, people know about this, so what can we do to actually market it and sell it? And, yeah. Try and make some money, basically. I mean, uh, there's there's that part, and I get that, right? Yeah. But I mean, if you think have about a heart, Hollywood. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's more than have a heart, have a soul. <laughs> Looking at you, DreamWorks. Um, but yeah, if if you look at like you know old craftsmen who were making tables and, and you know classical painters who are just really putting everything from their imagination onto the you know canvas or a piece of wood or. You know, a sculptor working from you know a statue. I mean, yeah, it, nobody would have thought that their original idea were going to make them any money, right, from the get go. Right. But I mean, Salvador Dali, you know, it's 
proved otherwise. Pablo Picasso, all the famous artists that we've had. I mean, yeah, there are some stories of the starving artist, etc. But I, I feel like you know, filmmaking is no different than painting. Is no different than you know, sculpting or carving from wood. It's you know, how much dedication a person with vision is going to put into it. And yeah, there's you know, I, I felt like I feel like when big studios go for the license, you know, it's just the low hanging fruit. You know, it's, pretty, that's pretty well. That's exactly it's, it's why the quickest way. Yeah. <laughs> it's the quickest way to do it. And uh, Windsor McKay who is one of the earlier pioneers of animation, had this quote. He said, uh, you turn this you know, wonderful medium into a business, you know, you'd, or turned into an industry, uh, bad luck. You know? And I think he forever cursed the <laughs> film industry with that. But Because uh, there are some really wonderful ideas that sort of just fall by the wayside yeah. and no one ever hears of it because they don't have the advertising dollars. They don't have the big studio lot or equipment. And you know, you get rogues like Robert Rodriguez who you know go down to Mexico to shoot with like seven thousand dollars and pops out with something original. Yeah. Or Tarantino or Martin Scorsese, you know, with Boxcar Bertha and you know all of his earlier films. And, you know, those are really wonderful ideas, and I wish Hollywood would you know, kind of. Yeah, there's there's more. stuff like that that you know kind of finds its way. You talk about you know Napoleon Dynamite, which you know. 10, 11 years ago at Sundance was, you know, a huge hit and sensation Then goes on to make a, you know, a bunch of money. And, um, you know, you have those gems that come out every once in a while. And I guess that's kind of what we have to, you know, look for is keep trying to find those independent gems out there. Hollywood studios are going to put out stuff that's fun. But, you know, if you want something with a little more you know, artistic depth, then you've got to search elsewhere. I, so, but I think on the artistic depth, I think people are really coming back to that. Like, people are really looking for stories. Like, Hurt Locker, that was pretty original. I mean... Theme-wise, you know, it's been said, but you right. know, the story itself was very unique and very personal. And yeah. I think uh, the more personal a movie gets, you know, I think the more people... But that's how people it. connect with films. Right. You know, they connect through the people and, and the characters in the films, really, is, is what it all boils down to. So kind of moving on a little bit and talking about um, some more animation stuff. So yeah, going right back to almost the, you know, established properties, you know, Netflix. Netflix has been a big player in... And a little bit of everything nowadays, yes. you know, they're their own network essentially, you know, winning Emmys and being nominated for films and um, the adventures of Puss in Boots based off of the Puss in Boots character from the Shrek right. movies now has its own animated series on Netflix. So now Netflix, now Netflix is not just, you know, going into the live action, but actually their own original animated stuff. So as an animation studio, now you guys are working for a lot of other people, but are you, are you also creating your own content that's original content that you're trying to get out there you know like this as well yes we we've got a couple of them going right now uh one of them is in the hand of nickelodeon mm -hmm. other one is in the hand of uh, disney xd but can't say anything sorry uh, but we also have created a couple of our own animated shorts mike and wayne is one of them and it went on to be officially selected for the sunscreen film festival west last year which is great <sighs> sunscreen west why does that sound so familiar <laughs> huh. Yeah, and uh, and currently we're in pre-production for our first feature film. Good. That we're developing here at the studio, and that we're hoping to release uh, within the next three years. So now you talk about doing a feature film. You know, when you watch the credits for a feature film like Lego Movie or anything else, and you look at the end of that movie, and it's like hundreds and hundreds of names scrolling past. So if you guys are going to be doing a feature film, is this our hundreds and hundreds of names here in the background or you know it's gonna be five names on the film as the animators what do you you know what do you guys yeah. think and uh this is this is it this is the crew that's gonna do it that's awesome and i mean if you look at people like joanna quinn um ralph bakshi bill plimpton uh alan foreman you know uh, aaron augenblick you know all these filmmakers and Animated, animators and animation directors and studios. I mean, they're small, but they do some really huge work. I, I believe Augenblick Studios did a, a Zoolander animated feature. Well, that's, I didn't know there was a Zoolander animated feature. Yeah, that, that's coming out soon. Okay. And, I was going to say, did I miss that somewhere? How's, how did that happen? Yeah, but I mean, Bill Plimpton had uh, his feature film, Cheatin', was, uh, I think, nominated. Well, it wasn't nominated, but it was submitted for an Oscar. It was in consideration. Right, for, consideration. And, in uh, consideration to be nominated, but then not actually nominated, right? Yeah, yeah. Many layers there. But uh, Bill Plimpton, I mean, he does feature films all on his own. Yeah. It's just by himself, you know, drawing every frame. And, I mean, we have limited resources, but we have a lot of talent. Sure, so sure. This, and, how, and how long, you know, let's say you're able to start from, all right, now we can start 
you know, today, how long will it take you and your team to animate, you know, a feature length film? When we did the math, it pulls out to about 22, 23 months. Which, that actually kind of falls right in line with what typically, uh, you know, a, a major Hollywood production... I mean, talk, look at any of the Pixar films. They, mm-hmm. they have a five-year kind of window that they do for those films from... It takes five years from sort of initial concept by the time they, they finish it. So, that's not... Even on a, you know, a live-action film, it can take a couple of years from you know, beginning to end... Yeah. With the amount of you know special effects and animation in a lot of films, so that's that's not bad. Oh, it's not, and with a very considerably small crew. Sure. No. So and I guess so. The interesting question then would be: so if you're working, you know, twenty two, twenty three months to create a feature film, you've got the you know you're fully financed and everything else. Does that mean all the other work that you've been doing, or all the other clients that you've been taking on, are you still doing that as well, or is it you know just? Everybody's working on the feature for it would be if period. we were fully financed, right? And then that was it, nothing else. Nothing else but doing that. But uh, we also like working with our clients too. Sure. So you don't want to take two years off and then have to try and go back and you know reestablish relationships with clients after that. No, <laughs> that would right. yes. So that's that's it's something that's in the works currently. So if anybody is interested in fully financing uh, Echo Bridge Pictures feature film, you can uh, you can find them online at. Uh, Echo Bridge Pictures.com? Echo dash bridge.com. And you can find us on Twitter too at Echo Bridge. And we'll respond within minutes. <laughs> and you can always contact us at the Film Commission as well for more information about what they do. And I'm sure they're always looking for, for new clients and everything else. So, in, uh, so a little a new segment that we want to try and throw into the podcast here um, as we're going to be sort of changing things up over the, over the next couple of months, next couple of episodes as we figure out you know, how we want to structure the podcast and everything is. Um, and maybe we'll call this something different in the future. But right now we're calling it, you know, thumbs up and thumbs up and thumbs down. So, so for the week, you know, you're, you're going to tell us something. You're giving a, a thumbs up in, you know, the entertainment industry, animation world or whatever the week. And then I'll, I'll give us a, something that's, that's a thumbs down this week. So what's your, what is your thumbs up for the week? Oh, man. I, I, thumbs up has to go to the Peanuts movie. At least for now. I could change my mind. So don't put money on me. Uh, but I actually think it's well made. It's looking to be a solid film, and I'm, I was really excited to see more development from it this week. So that's my thumbs up. All right, good. So Esteban's thumbs up for the week is the Peanuts movie, and then my thumbs down for the week is actually the uh, Dish Sling TV Internet Bundle. It's a lot. To, that's a that's a whole mouthful there. You'll have to you have to look that up to see what it is. But essentially, uh, Dish Television, you know, the uh, satellite company. What they're doing is they're getting into the, you know, internet bundle game where you don't have to have a cable subscription or a Dish TV subscription. You could instead get an internet subscription to, you know, like you have Netflix or whatever. And what they'll do is it's a, a, a small set number of channels. You can have X number of channels that you're paying $20 a month or whatever, and then you can watch those TV channels on whatever web-enabled device that you have as opposed to... Mm. You know, and so the reason I'm giving it a thumbs down is because now people have, you know, the uh, you have you, you're going to pay whatever ten or twenty dollars a month for Netflix, and then you're going to pay your twenty dollars a yeah. month for your Dish TV, so you can have cable television, and then you're going to pay for maybe Amazon Prime or maybe Hulu or whatever else. And so by the time you have paid for all these different packages, which uh, a lot of the TV channels that you want are not included in that package, for example. Broadcast television not included in that package, which it doesn't need to be because people forget broadcast television is already free. Bad it's, form. It's already Bad free. Bad form. So by the time, but by the time you pay for all this, and you have to pay for the internet in order to be able to even get the bundle, so you can watch Netflix and everything else, you're paying the same thing you pay for a cable subscription, anyways. And it's it's stupid, <laughs> basically. That's great. Um, so and it's just it's just you know people are trying to find these different ways. Even CBS now, and this this boggles my mind. So this is an additional additional kind of thumbs down thumbs down. Is CBS now actually also has its own subscription service, where you can subscribe to CBS for whatever it is eight dollars a month, and then you can watch all of the CBS television shows. And that's, again, it's like the NFL Network, right? But CBS is already free. It's already free. You don't have to pay for it. It's already free anyways cbs dish network that's that's why it's that's why it's thumbs thumbs down 
for the week. That's two thumbs down. Yeah, double. That's a double thumbs down. Okay. So. Well, you got two thumbs. I got two thumbs. That's, that's yes, quadruple. That's, that's, a, that's a double thumbs down. So I know we're, we're stealing from uh, Siskel and Eber back in the day that originated the thumbs down. So we'll have to come up with something different to call it for like down or thumbs down or negative or well hats off to them anyway whatever whatever we want to do so well anyways we're going to wrap up here for uh for the st pete clearwater film commission podcast thanks for if this was television we would say tuning in so i guess for logging on dialing in tuning in watching whatever analogies uh work for uh for watching this podcast on whatever whatever medium you're watching it so for Esteban here at Echo Bridge Pictures and all the animation staff in the background, everybody. Wait, say Keep hi. drawing. <laughs> Keep <laughs> drawing. <laughs> Thank, uh, thanks for watching and uh, we'll check you out next time.